I am delighted to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Dan Kamen, is the class of 1935 Distinguished Professor of Energy at the University of California, Berkeley. With parallel appointments in the Energy and Resources Group, the Goldman School of Public Policy, and the Department of Nuclear Engineering. In addition to his academic work, Dr. Kamen has advised the Obama administration on climate change issues, served as technical specialist for the World Bank, and was part of the IPCC team that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Please welcome Dr. Dan Kamen. Well, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and for really convening a soup to nuts, a science to application to cultural dialogue around energy issues because we, really, we rarely do that. And we've heard in the panel, I think, some exceptionally important comments on what is the role of basic science. I'm a physicist, and so I certainly started into this field much closer to kind of the core interests of, of the Perimeter Institute in thinking about what are the areas where fundamental breakthroughs in, in science is going to change the story. But I think we heard a really compelling introduction to the degree to which this is truly the interdisciplinary holistic world. And it's caused a number of people that saw breakthroughs in one area or another to really take stock of the degree to which we need a ongoing series of innovations, not just in basic science, not just in economics or policy and understanding behavior in cultural connections. And so what I'll try to address today are some of the places where I really do see opportunities. And so if I had a subtitle for this, it really would be something like an optimist guide to energy. We're at a remarkably important time. I'll mention some of the things that are happening at the global stage, but also at the very, very micro level. And I'm hoping that what people take away from this is that we critically need a very large interest in this area from a very much more diverse set of backgrounds within academia and far beyond than we have today. And again, so I hope I can do justice to highlighting those stories, um, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll, try to, I'll try, try to pull them together. And so our laboratory at Berkeley is a very interesting, very interdisciplinary place. Over 20 grad students, four or five postdocs, undergraduates, visiting scholars from around the world, partnership teams in East Africa, Central America, Southeast Asia. In fact, two of our students, Jose Lara and Nikki Avila, if you could just stand for a second, are here. And we'll hopefully tell you much more about the kinds of projects that we're doing. And again, we highlight them on the website, which is much more than an academic site. Um, and again, on a Twitter feed I've, I've listed here as well, just to give some of the reflections on what we're doing. At the level of what our opportunities and challenges are, we will hear tomorrow from President Obama and Premier Xi about some of the global changes that we hope can take place. And again, with an, with an optimist view to what's going on, we really can change the story. But I want to start from the micro level that we heard some really compelling comments around and build outward. Um, this is a bit of the opposite of the approach I would take as a physicist before. Sort of look at the big picture and then, and then, and then burrow in, whether it's solid state theory or, or, or quantum electrodynamics that I used to do in the old days. So I'll try to take the other perspective. What have we learned from some of the efforts that came before? And critically, what are those opportunities where I view academic-based research organizations and operations have just a unique opportunity now to partner globally. We heard it with, with the comments about some of the tribal energy issues, what's going on with, with First Nations. We've heard it as well with some of the challenges that, that are in front of efforts to bring basic energy services. And so I'll try to use that to start. Um, and again, I hope that I can do justice um, to how diverse this field is. And so one of the places to begin is this issue of the most basic energy services. And there's a fascinating story that I'll start very briefly on around what we've learned about cook stoves, about the politics around energy, not only at the national level, but the gender politics, the number of, of, of couples around the world that mediate their marital or partner disputes through the thermostat is non-trivial. And the number of times when one of the members, I won't mention any names, often the woman, um, raises the temperature and a man lowers the temperature. And those dynamics play out in all kinds of issues and they relate to things like economics, body mass, 
preference in terms of type of environment. We need to learn about these very diverse topics as we go. That leads into this issue of on and off grid energy. And I'll try to highlight those because what we're now seeing is more opportunity to innovate, both in basic science, engineering, economics, and a much broader set of cultural stories that are really critical. And I'll end with uh, something which I hope ties them back together, and that is that the iPod didn't replace the Sony Walkman, didn't replace the Victrola before that, because it simply provided the same service. It hopefully did that and more. And one of the stories that's really been lost in the discussion about dirty energy, clean energy, however you want to call it, is the succeeding technologies are not simply more ethically or broader environmentally appealing substitutes. They are in some ways better. And one of the lessons that we heard briefly in the story of the mini grids in Haiti is that there are actual elements of the clean energy story that are not just substituting green electrons for brown or black or whatever color they might be, but the service is fundamentally better. And one of the areas that we are incredibly far behind is capturing and understanding those things. In fact, calling them externalities, the current term, does it a huge injustice. Yes, they're externalities, but because our economic system is far too limited to, to capture many of the things that we heard in the, in the discussions about the First Peoples in Southern Ontario. So I'm hoping all of those will come together and we'll end up with trying to learn from clean energy, not just trying to find places to shoehorn it into a dirty system. After all, the basic math, something I can do as a physicist, is clear. We created the last Industrial Revolution and it took roughly 150, 170 years. And the math on the solution side is now very clear. We have to replace all of that not in a century and a half, but in two to three decades. And none of our economic or cultural institutions at the large scale reflect that. We have community efforts, we have a number of things that highlight maybe we could learn how to do this, but almost none of it says in a generation or two, we heard the seven generation comment from Theo, are aligned with what we know the basic math to be. And that means the rate of change we're going to have to see is going to have to just go far beyond what we've seen before. And that's the big challenge ahead of us. And so tomorrow, President Obama and Premier Xi will do something that I, I believe we'll look back on years and decades from now as an example of finally accelerating. We've had 21 years of the climate uh, conference of the parties. And at the one in Paris in December, the 21st, maybe a coming of age time, as the French chair used to say, we actually got a little adult thinking about this process. The United States and China stepped out of a 20 year process of 180 nations debating together, slowing each other up in all of the standard political ways. And they said, on energy and climate, we are the big two. We are the biggest users, we're the biggest polluters. We need to take advantage of that G2 status and go from two of the biggest laggards to two of the leaders. And neither um, leader has pulled their, far, their full uh, congresses and assemblies and industries along, but they stepped out with a very unconventional climate deal that said, we're not even going to agree to hit the same climate target in the same year. We're going to have targets that are differentiated based on where we're coming from. But in each case, we plan to bend the curve, and by 2025 or 2030, to totally transform that picture. All of the climate meetings before had little results here and there, the largest being the Kyoto Protocol, something that was ratified by some, not ratified by others. Canada discovered Alberta and had to de-ratify. There's a number of issues that come along with the complications of the politics of our energy system in this process. But this is the first time we had an agreement signed in December, and in April, a few months later, will be ratified. The US and China, as 40% of the global energy story, will move this along dramatically. Europe will certainly come along, so the 55% ratification number will happen overnight compared to past deals. And that really highlights a huge opportunity, but it's all opportunity. 
the national commitments that, that move forward, some of which were large-scale clean energy, some were energy efficiency, some were water, some were off-grid energy access. None of those are quantified in ways that really make sense. And so the type of work that you'll be doing for the week is really putting detailed numbers, spinning off companies, building case studies, quantifying with life cycle and financial assessments. So I'm hoping that one of the features that seems much larger scale than energy access that will come out of this meeting will be a very clear call for a price on carbon. Price on carbon will not solve energy access, but it allows bankers of all different flavors to speak the language of the planet. And we heard from Theo, we're not speaking that language, and we all know that we're not speaking that language. So the story of where we were going, four and a half or more degrees of, of global warming, now the commitments agreed to on paper, but not put into practice at the climate meeting in Paris, cut that down by over a degree. In fact, the, at the Clean Energy Ministerial in early June in San Francisco, it will be announced that we think we're really at about three or maybe 2.9 degrees, knowing that two degrees of global warming on average is our target, but that's no, um, um, that, that's no panacea. Every additional increment below that on average change dramatically changes the story. And as needs for energy ramp up dramatically around the world, we're going to have to decarbonize even faster. There are lots of interesting examples, and I only highlight this one from California to show that it is not an overnight process. I, uh, I hate to disagree uh, uh, publicly with Bill Gates. While I would love to see miracles, I love miracles. When they happen, they're wonderful. But the history of innovation in this area has actually been on sustained attention, funding university programs, getting companies on board. And so when you look at electricity consumption per person in California and the United States, we see um, these two curves that were basically the same. But through a series of fairly unexciting individual measures, California was able to shave off a significant amount of industrial energy consumption and shave off energy from the commercial sector and shave off energy from the residential sector so that a fundamental tenet of economic theory from the 60s was proven wrong. And that is that energy use must rise as GDP rises. And in fact, California's GDP has risen faster than the national economy and electricity use per person has been capped. That story translates to a series of, mes uh, of, of of messages for what we heard earlier today about this crisis of a billion people or more without even the most basic access. In fact, that story is even worse. The International Energy Agency, the uh, entity of record, not a particularly fast-moving uh, organization, not that they're not smart, but that their models are inherently conservative, forecasts that not only do we have over a billion people without access today, but that with all of the efforts of new projects and technologies, grid extension, all manner of things, that the forecast is by 2030, we will have failed even worse, and that we will have made, made essentially no change in this story as we move forward. In fact, in, on, this, on this figure here, the leftmost pie chart is the number of people in millions on, uh, who are off-grid, both in urban areas, um, in, the, in the bluish color, and in purple, and the off-grid community. And while there is forecast improvement in Latin America, there is a recipe for continued failure in South Asia and Southeast Asia, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it gets worse. And so our current forecast is exactly opposite of where we want to go. So if I were to plot out total population on the planet and the total population on grid, the black line at the bottom is the difference, since I know how to do uh, those kinds of sums. And so if we look at that, billion and a half people without access to electricity, we have three large pots of activities that we know where we could possibly make a change today. And so, well, again, I would love a miracle. I'm not counting on one. It would make the job easier. But essentially, we have, we can continue and expand and make better and smarter, hopefully, our on-grid programs to expand out grids, whether they're regional or larger. We have the off-grid space, the so-called pay-as-you-go individual products that I'll spend a few minutes on in a second. And then we have the area that, to my mind, is the most exciting, but it's the most like the 
information silicon revolution in the 60s and 70s. It is a, the most fascinating area, and it's the one that does not yet have that killer app to make it a critical part of our story. You heard the challenges in the, in, in the, in the Haitian mini grids, a level of aggregation and of innovation of technologies that is incredibly full of potential, and yet the number of mini grids that have really made it, they serve a wide range of needs, they're commercially viable, they're actually supported and not opposed by the larger national utilities, that is a challenging story. In fact, when we started working on off-grid systems in East Africa and Kenya, the story was we would try to find places to put uh, local household solar systems in place, and we would work as far as we could from the places where the national utility, Kenya Power Lighting Corporation, which we all called Kenya Paraffin Lamps and Candles, was in operation because we knew that the tires of the trucks we were working with would be slashed if the people from the utility figured out who was trying to sell off-grid products. That's the exact opposite of what we learned with the information technology, the Silicon Valley revolution, where a diverse set of many players, the kind of learning and recognizing our failures, not that failures are a reason to stop, but that failures are a reason to move forward. In fact, the most common line that every CEO or CEO wannabe in Silicon Valley says is that being a venture capitalist in, the, in this space is a license to fail positively meaning I haven't failed to create a light bulb, as Thomas Edison said, I found 999 ways not to make it work, and the next one is gonna make it work. And it's that willing to fail and willing to try that we are lacking in this space. And in fact, the lessons are remarkable. What I've plotted here is electricity access and a, a, a variety of different indicators, from zero access up to 100%. The large figure um, on the left is the Human Development Index. That's made up by one-third GDP, one-third life expectancy, and one-third educational uh, uh, attainment. And when you look at that, little broader, little less simplistic than just GDP per capita sort of metric, we see a very clear correlation, not necessarily causation. And then when we dig in on many of the indicators that last year the United Nations adopted as the official sustainable development indicators, we see gender parity in education, the proportion of children from, uh, from first form, first grade who complete education, the number of people in abject poverty living on less than a dollar a day, and maternal mortality all show the right movement as we gain access to more energy. Now, I'm not going to say at this point, do I think there is a causation, not just a correlation, I happen to think there is a, uh, a, a causation, but we're going to get to that as we see some of the information. So as we look beyond the grid, to start off with those pro programs that are the oldest, I will start with cook stoves and some of these off-grid pay-as-you-go products. And one of the most interesting stories here is that information really does set you free. So Martin Luther King was absolutely right in terms of it doesn't solve the equation, but without it, it's very hard to move forward. One of the big challenging areas that I hope these, these next couple slides will highlight is the degree to which we are working as hard as possible in this area, but we have largely left off understanding behavior, psychology, human relations in this story. For a lot of reasons that boil down to the excitement of the basic awards, the basic rewards financially within universities, within companies that are available for hardware innovations for basic science, the, the field that I come from and, and, and our hosts here at Perimeter Institute are doing such great work on, is that we need to go much further. And projects can't be based on basic science and some engineering with a little dabble of behavior and psychology thrown in. They have to be co-equal where those social science and humanities areas lead, not just are added in as kind of a, a documenter of the process we're making. And because of that, we miss huge numbers of economic, economic opportunities, many of which are very much like that, I, that evolution from the Victrola to the Sony Walkman uh, to, uh, to the MP3 player to the iPod. There are things that are, that are opportunities that we're not taking advantage of because we've blinderized ourselves. And so the story of kerosene and cooking is an amazing one. We knew early on 
that there were large health that there were large health benefits from cleaning up the ways we burn fuels. In fact, I was uh, taking my seven, my 13 year old daughter to a movie, and she literally turned to me halfway through the movie and said, "Dad, were you guys really so stupid as to think that if you knew smoking was bad for you?" that it was okay to have a smoking section on an airplane as if the molecules would go to the barrier and then kind of, oh, I shouldn't go to, that's the non-smoking section and go back. That kind of, you know, could you really be so dumb really pervades a lot of the ways in which we haven't taken advantage of the fact that we know that, for example, black carbon from, from inefficient cook stoves is a huge health risk. We also know that the number of people who cook this way around the world is very large and that it's disproportionately a burden on women and children. So there's an environmental and there's a gender and there's a, a ethnic injustice involved in not putting more effort into this area. And yet it's taken decades to even get the basic economics. Kerosene is perhaps a $25 billion global industry. That doesn't mean $25 billion that can go from the poorest on the planet to support new technologies, but it means that if your technology and if your market mechanisms and if the education is good enough, there is, in fact, a market out there. And in fact, the evolution to look at how bad those pollution levels are is, in fact, a direct mirror of the places that don't have energy access today. It took two decades of research to confirm this very easy fact that we observe very high causally based illness levels disproportionately on women and children and on minority groups from those high pollution levels. That's fine in the academic setting, but this 150 to 60 year industrial revolution number one that now must be replaced with the second one on the order of a generation and a half means that we're gonna have to speed this process up. And so, and so Naomi Oreskes and the other eloquent authors of Merchants of Doubt are gonna have to help us lead the story so that we do not say, well, took us two decades, three decades to cut through the smoke that was being blown by the tobacco industry. We're now gonna to have to, in very uncomfortable ways, because everyone in this room is in some way invested in that fossil fuel economy, either directly financially or the services. I flew her on an airplane, so there's no, I'm not guilty of that association. Finding the ways to accelerate this process is gonna be a remarkable transformation and it's much more cultural than technical. Today, three decades after it started, the cook stove story is really succeeding. There are better cook stoves in the world. There are $100 million uh, improved cook stove programs. There are charismatic megafauna, as I like to say, like Julia Roberts and Secretary of State Clinton, who have made this part of their story. And these very traditional areas are now integrated into funding from carbon markets, from health investments, a whole variety of efforts. So we've learned a lot, but we've learned a lot very slowly. On the off-grid and mini-grid story, there is an equally fascinating effort. When I first began studying solar technology in grad school in the 1980s, I was literally told by Nobel laureates, who I won't name, Nicholas Blumbergen, um, that this was a wonderful area and that you, know, you and other young students should go work on it, but solar would never be more than a few percent of our energy mix because we couldn't destabilize grids with intermittent forms of renewables. That story persisted for a decade. Many faculty in the room remember those, oh, two and three percent renewables on the grid, you know, it'll become unstable, it'll go communist, whatever it might do, all kinds of crazy things will happen. In fact, that story was one that was relatively easily solved with an integration of power electronics and understanding a little bit more about the spatial dynamics of renewable energy. So now we have a situation where what was the most expensive renewable energy, solar, has fallen in price so much and so rapidly that the largest and least expensive new energy projects in India and in the United States in the last year were solar or wind. Remarkable transformation. Solar is on a path now to be the base load cost, meaning unsubsidized, cheaper than our oil, gas, and coal options within the coming decade. And we've learned, however, that just hitting that price point actually is much less liberating than it might seem. 
It opens doors to off-grid technologies, but at the same time, our large infrastructure, which we heard in the first panel, built into sending transmission lines where our fossil fuel resources or hydropower resources were, means that we are completely mismatched to take advantage of these clean energy options that are now available. On the good side, however, while this, ramp, this, this fall in prices happened, this green curve represents the ramp up of solar photovoltaics around the world. And this is fairly interesting. This 65 gigawatts of solar deployed around the world is equal to the peak demand of California, the, lar the eighth largest economy on the planet. Now, of course, this is distributed worldwide, but it speaks to something which is changing. Earlier this month, California transitioned from having hydropower as the largest non-fossil energy in the mix. And I say non-fossil because different places in the world judge large hydro to be a renewable or not, sustainable or not, based on its other environmental and social impacts. But California now has now transitioned that solar photovoltaics at 7% is the largest of the renewables in operation. In fact, California is on a path to hit 33% renewables, excluding nuclear and excluding large hydro, by 2030. And we are on path to hit 50%, sorry, in 2020, and to hit 30, and to hit 50% renewables by 2030. That is a huge fraction of the equation. One of the interesting science opportunities this has opened up is what you see in this picture here. This is a, one of my grad students who is now director of energy access at Facebook, working on studying what's taking place in this very diverse, very chaotic off-grid market. One of the ways in which science has played a critical role is that the, is the, the basic lab work on light emitting diodes, which won the Nobel Prize in physics last year, on the opportunities to make solar cells as efficient as possible from a diversity of different materials has enabled much of this process. But at the same time, there's been an academic fixation on the efficiency of a solar cell and the quest for what is the theoretical maximum efficiency of, of a cell, a tricky number to actually to figure out on the material science side. In fact, dollars per watt is a much more valuable number or dollars per kilowatt hour is far more valuable than what is the maximum efficiency we can hit. Not that we shouldn't explore the upside for a whole variety of long-term transitions, but having equal focus on energy services delivered, not just the basic science of it, is a critical part of the story. So when the effort to get off-grid lighting products into the market in large measure was first proposed by a bunch of under 30-year-old um, junior uh, staffers at the World Bank and other agencies, their elders literally said, this is a waste of time. This is an effort to put glorified flashlights in the hands of poor people. A, we don't do research on the development dime, a direct quote from the documents criticizing the effort to take advantage of these emerging products, and people don't want flashlights, they want energy services, and that's exactly right. What you see here is a range of products, some high quality, some quite low quality, all of which have taken advantage of this remarkable decline in the price of solar cells and the decline in storage, largely lithium ion batteries, and this revolution in LED lights. For systems here that have as small as a tenth of a watt generating capacity, the small red one over on the left, we've seen a whole range of basic lighting products most of which you take home with zero down payment and you pay them off over time with mobile money. But then we start to see things thrown into the mix. Tossed in the middle there is a cell phone. And when a research group at the University of College London said, why don't we add in a cell phone charging port in the side of that battery, in three countries in Africa, sales of these pay-as-you-go devices doubled within a year. Remarkable transformation. Whole range of products, solar panels of different sizes. Now we see kits where you can take home small amount of solar uh, lighting, a GSM-enabled communication device, lights, some that are fixed, some that are mobile, that you pay for with daily or weekly or monthly online payments. 
Here is a picture um, from Western Kenya of a thousand such systems for which we gather the data directly from their online payments and discovered that it was actually quite easy to determine what messages we could send back to these thousand families that would improve their, um, the value of the service to them. So for those, for those families, these two graphs, the red and the blue, show the payment history for those individuals. You don't pay every day, but online on your phone with mobile money, it's something called M-Pesa, um, uh, uh, just an online uh, trusted payment service. The families on the, uh, on, on, on the red on the top, they, for whatever reason, did not pay for their system. Their average payments didn't, um, their average payments um, online didn't average to about 60 cents US a day, and they did not pay their systems off, and during the course of the year, they were turned off. The ones on the blue on the bottom, however, those bulk of, those bulk of them, over 92%, all paid off their systems, but each one of those lines is a life story. The, the lines far to the left are people that paid it off far in advance of the black line, which is paying it off over a year so you owned it. Those families would actually benefit by messages sent to them that said, you know, you see you're paying it off well, you might actually want to invest in something additional. A DC solar freezer or a low power uh, color television. Those people who are near the black line, well, you're paying it off at the average rate and they should be encouraged you're doing well. And then those, those stragglers, some of which who were way in arrears, you can see some of those individual lines, the people were far from paying off their system, but then they paid it off, or here's one that was lagging far behind, they paid it off. All these people got messages back from us working with the company that told them things. In fact, several of the people here who weren't working right the message we sent them was just to simply to look at the output of their panel, compare it to what the sun was available where they were, and you can see we had the data for the sunshine, and say, you know, I think your panel might be shaded, it might have cow shit on it, who knows what it might be. You might want to move it, clean it, check it, whatever else. In fact, this worked wonderfully. That's exactly the story of these individuals who went from a system that worked but was not functional for them to paying it off and, in fact, expanding these over time. Here is one of those individuals who wasn't paying for it. He then paid it off, and then he went on, and, it, and he's, in fact, purchased a color television. And so you see all of these stories have an element of science, an element of engineering, but a huge element of human connection, of understanding the market, of understanding what goes on. And that really, I think, sets us up to learn a little bit more about the area that I believe will be the next great innovation, and that is the kind of mini-grid story we heard from EarthSpark. So one of the big features that's so exciting here is that while off-grid products inherently serve you as an individual or as a household, ultimately the security, the resilience of larger systems, whether it's large traditional grids or mini-grids, opens up a new world. And so an example of one of the first mini-grids we installed was on a coastal community in the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, an area that is an indigenous autonomous zone. And one of our students worked um, for years on energy education projects. You can, he's talking about, about um, CFLs versus regular light bulbs. Um, and as people started to buy information systems, they got more and more interested in, can we build our own wind turbines? Can we do so to power mini grids so that we can freeze fish? In fact, this woman at the market is telling me why her household is so much better to her than her neighbors who doesn't get to freeze fish. It was an interesting story of what you get out of the system. A piece of evolving economic lore or wisdom, depending on your perspective, was can we understand how much the benefit of one innovation will make in the picture? And so I've just plotted out the energy used in this community, before they installed meters to look at the energy use they had, they weren't charging, but they just knew the information. After they installed meters, and then after they installed light bulbs, and you can see there was a series of improvements of their load curve. In fact, we put that together in what's called a marginal abatement or a McKinsey curve, after the consulting firm that did the work. This is the cost or the savings to the community as a function of the amount of carbon abated. And so installing meters saved the money from the beginning. 
installing compact fluorescence, uh, putting in public lighting. Everything saved the money up until they installed solar. In fact, what they did to power the system was to shrink the size of a diesel generator run by the, fris the fish freezing company. They installed the public systems with the, with the revenues, and then they chose to expand the system to pay by adding some solar to the story. So that's the classic off-grid, mini-grid story. But I also want to you know, caution us that this is not about just development done on the opportunities for the poor. This is the other extreme. This is an atoll in French Polynesia. It's the atoll that actually was deeded to Marlon Brando after he made Mutiny on the Bounty. And we were asked to design a 100% renewable energy system for the island. And I said, well, of course I'll go. Who wouldn't want to go hang out at this island and design a project? But I had zero thinking that this was going to teach me something about energy. It's very much the, the story we heard from EarthSpark that you should learn to fail. So we were told, take this, take this Motu, take this atoll, and design a 100% renewable system for it. So of course, this is, a, this, is a, this is what it looks like today. We installed a large solar array on the side of the runway. We also installed a biofuel system to uh, harvest coconut, which we discovered French Polynesia was exporting to Hawaii at a financial loss due to a crazy regulation and that every bit of coconut husk which they didn't export simply saved the money. So all the neighboring atolls were willing to send uh, the coconut husk here um, for free, if, essentially. We installed a SWAC system, a pipe that goes down a kilometer to bring up six degrees C cold water, which is now the air conditioning, and that cut 90% of the air conditioning bill for the island right off. We installed a flow battery, an emerging technology to give them several days of storage. And at the end of the story, we were just about there. A company that wasn't ready at the time, uh, based in Perth, builds these ocean wave energy systems. It's a tank of fresh water moored to the, bot to the ocean floor. And we wanted to install it, but they didn't have commercial units available. And because we were so focused on the energy story, we sort of bemoaned the loss of this. We put a little more solar on to zero out the system. But after we were done, this company said, you know, now we're ready to install. Now we're installing one. And the fascinating feature is we had left out a critical part of the story. Of course, islands don't just need energy. They need water. And fresh water is a byproduct of having a piston system on the bottom of the ocean where you get energy out of that, but the bottoming cycle for the engineers in the room was enough to run a reverse osmosis filter. We didn't plan that in at all into the equation. And now that this is being installed, this is in fact the most valuable feature. And for us, it was purely an add-on to this luxury system where we weren't thinking about the broader uses at all. And that really highlights to me the degree to which this learning by doing, this failing as you go is critical to the process. Unfortunately, as we heard in the first panel, mini grids have a very high level of failure so far, largely because it is such an incredibly complicated story. On the one hand, off-grid products like I've showed you, those lanterns, are wonderful in their simplicity because you sell them or lease them or give them to a single user. There's no infrastructure beyond that sales transaction. Large grids have all the benefits of all of us being on board, anchor customers, large efforts. Mini grids are in some ways the best and the worst of both. They need to do all of the billing and all the services and the reliability of a traditional grid, and yet you're doing so on a shoestring. It's a minimal operation in many cases, a little bit of solar or a little bit of microhydro, uh, some wind. It is the hardest aggregation, and that's why we need collaborations that are far broader than just energy to make it work. And so here's a mini grid that we worked to install in Kenya recently, and in fact, what's interesting about it is that it was a tea plantation, a community already organized, already in shared plantation style uh, housing, if you will, set up by the tea owner, um, not very attractive housing, that were an amenable community that wanted to build that system largely for the political independence of the plantation owner. And in fact, energy services allowed them to open their own stores and not go to just a company store. And it really liberated them from some of the challenges. 
an example of incredibly simple back and forth between power electronics and services is highlighted in this mini-grid in Bhutan, of course, the kingdom of happiness. When this mini-grid, based entirely off of microhydro, was first installed in, in this village in Bhutan, they went the opposite direction. Everyone bought rice cookers, other technologies to take advantage of the power, and this kingdom of happiness literally had fistfights in the dirt streets of the village. And that was because everyone wanted to cook at the same time. Electric rice cookers all went on the same time. They immediately tripped out the system, and it generated a real displeasure, to say the least, of what was, was going on. So what you see here is the prototype of a device called the grid share. It's simply a sensor that tells you how much power is being used and whether you hooking up your device will cause the system to go over. So it's got red, green, and yellow stoplights, um, little LED lights on it. And what happens is if you plug your device in, in your house, and you get a green light, you can add more things to it. If you plug your device in, generally your rice cooker, and you get green and red, it says, yes, you can turn this device on, but nothing else. And then if you get purely red, it says no other devices need come onto the system. So that's information, but not action. In fact, the action that, that resulted from this shared information was that neighboring families along the street then cooked rice collectively. And we didn't plan that at all. We didn't orchestrate it. We provided the information. The community came up with a resolution. And because rice cookers were over 80% of their initial burden, sharing cooking, staggering keeping warm ended up being a simple solution, something which sadly it's hard to get a Nobel Prize for. But that's exactly the kind of integration with what our academia does today and finding opportunities to enable this kind of technological innovation that we need to do. Now, both mini grids I've highlighted so far are rural systems. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a brilliant effort going on by a team at MIT to highlight what would be the economic and the resilience benefit in Cambridge, Massachusetts of a series of mini grids connecting houses together. And what they've done is to look at the demands. They have some, some homes that use relatively little energy, some that use much more, and finding within any given pocket, what are the optimal linkages? And so the project here is to say, let's integrate solar into this community and find the places to put the solar, to chop off the peak demand during the day when solar was on, to give resilience to these mini-grids, which are then themselves connected together. And it actually is an eco a system of mini-grids for Cambridge, which is more resilient, lower cost in the long run than the current system. And that's, again, an example of taking mini-grids out of their comfort zone of rural developing countries and finding opportunities to think differently. In fact, if I conclude by returning to Kenya, the largest geothermal plant in the world today is in California, but the largest implement exploration and implementation process around geothermal is in Kenya. And right now, along the Rift Valley um, in, in western Kenya, there is an effort to build out not only a series of geothermal plants, this is a 10 megawatt uh, new pilot well that's gone in in, in Alkaria in this geothermal site in Kenya, but an, an effort to go from a country that is 60% hydropower supported for on-grid energy to 60% geothermal because of the concern about the need to preserve streams for agriculture, for nature, and because of the, the already observed increased variability due to climate change. And so this is a case where the switch to a renewable uh, energy source allows a larger industrial re-examination of the country. In fact, Kenya right now is placing industrial operations along the Rift Valley in these areas of geothermal power. And I highlighted, there's a picture many of you may have seen from the New York Times highlighting California's folly, that energy is, of course, not the only story. The mini-grid example I, I highlighted before was one where thinking just a little bit new about water changes our, perce our perception. And we have lots and lots of cases. This is a, a, just a, a graphically terrible example from Southern California about really not learning any of those lessons. And so what I like to say is that 
Our clean energy process needs rigor without the mortise. And what we really have to get into this equation is efforts to understand there's an energy footprint, there is a water footprint, there are efforts to think differently. So one of the examples where California is now learning from elsewhere is this effort here. I mentioned Bhutan. As they recognize the, effort, the benefits of these mini-grids, Bhutan, which has signed a massive 10 gigawatt export per, uh, contract with India to be largely filled by building large traditional hydro plants, quite controversial, has now decided to carve off one-tenth of that and work with one small California company that does agriculture and water systems to do small run of the river hydro and build up a series of mini grids that will aggregate their output and send it out. And so just recently at the White House Water Summit, this company, Natel Energy, has signed a gigawatt contract, gigawatt, to build micro hydro in Nepal to both power communities first and then to export the excess as part of this large international partnership. And so you get these very interesting opportunities that come up by thinking differently about the, the, these kinds of examples. And so the last piece of this will be, this is um, Lake Turkana in Kenya. This is um, the Nablam um, crater at the south end of the lake. And right behind it here is a place that was arid land, no development projects, an area of violence, of, of conflict but between some of the tribal groups, until efforts came in to examine and discover that this was, in fact, one of the best wind resource sites discovered anywhere um, on, the habited, uh, on the habited continents. In fact, it's a class seven for the energy experts wind site in this far remote area to the north. And through a dialogue around the communities in the area, there is now a largest wind farm in Africa being assembled in the area, and the former warring groups in the area have profit-sharing agreements to take advantage of the energy that comes out. And that doesn't guarantee that conflict won't return, but it highlights this opportunity to share these resources in challenged areas. This eight and a half me uh, a megawatt a facility in Rwanda is run, it's one that is run by an orphanage to both power the local community in the slum and to sell power outside. And that really brings me to the concluding part of the comments. We've talked about off-grid, talked about mini-grids, but ultimately this decarbonization has to be for everyone. We have to provide these energy access services, but we also have to make this much more of a regional partnership. And so I'm going to illustrate my final comments with just a picture of a modeling platform that we built initially for California, but have now expanded to, uh, to look at the energy mix across all of Western North America. We have partners in Arizona. We have partners at the University of Alberta in examining the energy mix that we could implement to reach our energy targets. And so the size of these pie charts are just designed to re reflect the mix of energy that we would see in this case in 2030, if we optimally deployed our energy to meet our climate targets. In fact, what we found across Western North America is that two degree target I began the lecture with for 2050, if we coordinated, and that if is huge, if we coordinated our, our, our development of our transmission lines and our use of renewable resources, that we find actually that this target would make sense by 2030. And I've mentioned that California's own target is 50% renewables by, um, by 2030. We find that if you think larger scale, the colors hopefully make sense. Large amounts of wind deployed um, in the upper Midwest, uh, solar in yellow, geothermal in red. There is some nuclear in the mix here as well. That this mix of an interconnected large regional system is actually lower cost than the business as usual forecast cost for the reason. Now it comes with some caveats. We find that this in 2030 would require a carbon price of $70. The carbon price in British Columbia is 30. In California it's 11. But there's no carbon price anywhere else in the region. So that is a stretch to think about it happening. But the overall costs are less. In fact, when we look at a whole range of scenarios each of which get us to that two-degree target. 
My favorite one is going to be right here, low-cost solar and low-cost storage. But others on here, what if nuclear is inexpensive and safe and manageable? What if we limit the amount of hydro because of environmental impacts? What if we recognize the amount of observed leakage of methane that we see from the Bakken and the Marcellus Shale and other systems, and hence cut down on the amount of gas? If we jump to 2030, we see a mix of these scenarios moving forward. If we jump to 2050, all of these scenarios get there. There's one that's intensive on nuclear, as I mentioned. There's one that we're not energy efficient. That's the one scenario that I can certainly not recommend. It's the one that costs more than business as usual. But these cases over here really give me a lot of hope. But the, the message I want to leave you with, though, is that while all of these are pathways to get there, the physics, the chemistry, the, the economics is not going to pick which of these we choose. These are political choices. This one here requires much more distributed solar. This one with batteries requires us to push on innovation in storage and deploy it as much as we've seen for solar. The one for nuclear implies that we solve some of the really fundamental problems that, that afflict that industry. These are cases that we will make as social choices, not as technical ones. And it's really this mix of everything from the off-grid that I began with to these large-scale solutions here that I hope really you know, give you a lot of hope that we can get it done, but a lot of worry that our pace of innovation and deployment and our attention to environmental and social gender, ethnic justice is nowhere near what it's got to be because these solutions will not be chosen by a physicist in the lab. They'll be chosen socially. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Cameron. I think we all have m a much more clear picture and uh, we, what we face in this particular space, but more importantly, uh, the opportunities that we need to see. So thank you again. Thanks so much.